Good morning, everybody here in El Shaddai Christian Assembly and on YouTube and Zoom. We appreciate you and uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. And uh, today's Sunday, June 9th, and uh, we're going to be talking about understanding the Father's love for us. But before we get there, in my keeping with this practice, because I really do believe that we're in the end times, and uh, so I want to make sure that we get the most important thing done, which is making sure we have a relationship with the Father right. And listen, I know I keep saying we're in the end times. Look, I could be wrong, but I wouldn't bet on it. I wouldn't bet my life on me being wrong. It's more important for me, for you to be right. You know, so don't say, well, you know, he's probably wrong. He's, people say that we've always been in the end times. Listen, it's the end times for you. You're not going to live forever. The day you were born, the clock started ticking. Yep. So you're closer today to the end times for you than any other time. So you can't afford for me to be right and for you to be wrong. Amen. That's the most important thing. So I'm going to share how to get this right. But I want to, a couple other things, I'm going to take a couple extra minutes. Here's the deal. You can't be right through someone else. You can't be right through your mother, your grandmother, your uncle, your father, grandfather. I don't care if they were a pastor. I don't care how anointed they were. You can't be right through them. You can only be right through the sacrifice of God's firstborn son, the Messiah. I don't care if you're Baptist, Catholic, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Islam, Jewish. I don't care. You can't be right through any other person other than through the blood that was shed by the Son of the Most High God. So don't gamble. Don't gamble and say, well, he may be wrong. Because, listen, if I'm wrong, I'm still okay. But if you're wrong, you're not. So here's, here's what you need to do to get that relationship right with the Father. All you have to do is just accept the offering of his firstborn son, the Messiah. You have to recognize that he did come here he lived, he died, he was crucified, but he rose again for you, for you to have life. And it says, that's all it takes for you to believe. It says, if you believe him, you have right now eternal life. You might not even feel different, but you will have eternal life. If you say, I accept that offering of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. If I accept that offering, what he did for me, and I make him my Lord, then that makes you right with the Father. And you are then born again. And your spirit is what's right. Your mind might still be thinking differently. So yet what you need to do is start reading the Bible and get into a fellowship where they teach the Bible. But that's the most important thing. We're going to talk about the love of the Father, but that was the most important thing. If you made that decision, why don't you reach out to us at office2210 at AOL.com. Send us an email so we can get back to you, all right? And our phone number here is 215-927. 7188, but I'd rather you email us so we can send you something. Okay? Appreciate you doing that. We're here located here in Philadelphia. The channel, in case you got here by accident, is the letter L space S H A D D A I dot Philly. So now we got the most important part taken care of. We're now going to get into the lesson for today. We're talking about understanding God's love for you. Not just for me, but understanding God's love for you. I started out this series talking about this gentleman had uh, saw a photo of his father and it was damaged. It was like in an attic or somewhere. And he looked at it and he says, you know what? That photo is not an accurate representation of my father. I want to fix it up so that people can see what my father was really like. And that's what this whole series of messages is about. So that you can see what your father or your potential father, if you haven't accepted him yet, what he's really like. He really, he's, he's loved, and he loves you. And it's not uh, a temporary, and it's not a conditional love. It's an unconditional love. He loves you no matter what, just like you love your children no matter what. You love your family no matter what. He loves all of us. It says he so loved the world that he gave his first begotten <coughs> son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. He wants our view of him to be correct. And I, I read it in uh, Matthew chapter 3. We, let me turn to that real quickly. Matthew chapter 3. 
This was the start of, of Yahushua's ministry. Or Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17. It says, as soon as Yeshua was baptized, he went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And that was the beginning of the ministry of the Messiah. Why? Because even though he was here all that time, the, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, had not yet descended upon him. And his ministry started when the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Amen? And so your ministry or your life really starts when the Holy Spirit comes in to dwell with you. How does that happen when you accept the, the, the Messiah as your Lord and Savior? I also talked about how the, um, the genealogy of, of Yeshua, he was regarded as a son of, of, um, of, of, of uh, Joseph, but he was the son of the, of the Most High God. Amen. We talked about how he's into relationships. That's why he has genealogy to show you all these relationships. One of the things we said before is that even though um, the Moabites were not allowed into the, into the temple, it says forever they were not allowed into the temple. But a Moabite, Ruth, is in the lineage of the Messiah because he's into relationships and he's into people, not just one specific people. As a matter of fact, Ruth's mother-in-law, which would have been Boaz's mother, was um, Rahab the harlot, who also was not in the lineage of the children of Israel. Boaz's mother was, was Rahab the harlot. I know you find that hard to believe, but she was, and she was also incorporated into the bloodline of the Messiah. Even though she lived in a land that the, the Israelites were um, slated to conquer. She lived in a land that they were slated to conquer, but yet she was incorporated into the bloodline of the Messiah. Why? Because Yahweh is into relationships. Even though he loved the children of Israel, they were, they were slated to do something specific for them. He also loved people outside of Israel. That's why Ruth was there. That's why Rahab was there. It says in, um, in Exodus, it says that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it was a mixed multitude. It wasn't just Israelites. The mixed multitude was also incorporated. In Exodus chapter 20, it shows that he's looking to, for everyone. It says that in Exodus chapter 12, it says if the foreigner among you is willing to be incorporated into what we do, they'll be treated just like one of the tribes of Israel. Why? Because his great love. He loves you. I want to say this too. You know, because we do this in, this in our society, is we make God or Yahweh the Father, we make him into a sound bite. You know, we just, well, God. You know, you think if you throw God into something, that doesn't legitimize it. He's not a sound bite. He wants to be your father. He wants to be more than a sound bite. He wants to be in a relationship with you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves your existence, which is why you're here. He loves you. He doesn't want to just be outside of, of, of watching this movie. He wants to participate in the movie of your life with you. He wants to be with you. It says he wants to never leave you nor forsake you. Now, he can be there, but you're not paying him attention. He needs your cooperation. He wants your cooperation. He wants your attention. He wants your intimacy with him. He wants to be involved. He wants, he really does. You know, some you can look at your life right now and say, really? He, he wants to be involved in this? Yes, he does. Because he wants to get in there with you to show you that you can overcome it. He wants to get right in there with you. You know, um, we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on the limb. Because we talk, you know, it's in the news 
Um, you have what's going on in Gaza over in, in Israel. And, and you have people making God into a soundbite. Saying, oh, God is, you know, he's against these people. He hates these people. He's, you know, they're, they're Hamas. Yes, Hamas, he hates what they do. But he loves people. And we make them into a soundbite. We throw them, we put this label of God here saying, we need to wipe all these people out while these people here are having the largest gay parade in Tel Aviv in the world. They're doing all, a lot of them are atheists and all this stuff. But God hates them, but loves these people. He's more than a soundbite. He loves people. Listen, his love is not based on borders. The Father's love is not based on borders. He showed you that through Rahab and Ruth and others. See, if his love was just based on the border, Rahab would not have been, she was across the border. Ruth was across the border. His love would have stopped at the border. But his love is not a sound bite that we, or this label we put on things that we say, good and bad. Listen, that's his, that's his decision. Why? Because he loves people. God so loved the world, except for Gaza, that he sent his firstborn son. We need to operate with the love of the Father. We need to understand the love of the Father for yourself. So here's what happens. When you understand the love of your Father for yourself, you start understanding how to love other people. We love because he first loved us. Amen. So again, that's why we take, we, we, we remove this these labels and and like I said, make make a like an anthem of well, you know, God is here and, and but He's not there. We're limiting Him when we do that. I know He said Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved, and I share it with you in the Scripture how what that says is basically He's preferred one over another. That we put hate, but that one didn't mean He hated Esau. He preferred Jacob. But he didn't hate Esau. He loves Esau. Here's a question for you. We're talking about the love of the Father because I, I don't know. This is something I've been thinking about how our Father is. But you ever have somebody that, that you know they love you and they made a promise to you at some point in your life, and yet they didn't keep it, either because they weren't able to, because of time, distance, or resources. Or they may, may no, no longer be here. They didn't get a chance to do the thing that they promised you. But you know they loved you. But they weren't able to keep the promise. Our God is a promise keeper. He loves you. And when he makes a promise to you, he won't make a promise to you that he can't keep. Our God is a promise keeper. There's not one promise to you that he's made to you that he won't keep. And it's not because he doesn't have the power. He has the power, and he has the willingness, and all he needs is your accomplice, your, you to be his accomplice, so that he can make those promises, make, those, make your destiny happen, because he loves you. I really can't put into words how much the Father loves you. But just think about how much you love, say, your child or, or your spouse or somebody. You love someone so much that you would do anything for them. And then it's multiplied how much he loves you. And it's not because of what you've done. It's just because you exist. He loves you because you exist. Not because of your bloodline. He doesn't love you because of, of where you're born or because of the gifts that you have. He just loves you because you exist. He loves you with a perfect love just because you exist. Because you exist, he loves you. But our Father will answer every prayer, every promise. I should say every, I should say every promise that he's made to you, he's able to keep. He's faithful to keep his promise to you. Is that, I mean, is that good for you? I'm just, that's good for me. That's good for me because I know when I understand his love, I understand that just like say I had somebody in my, in my past that, that prom may have promised me something, but they weren't able to keep it. I know that he's promised me things and he's faithful to keep it because of his great love and then accompanied with his love is his power and his righteousness 
and his grace and his mercy and his wisdom, his ability on how to make it happen for me. But the underlying, the underpinning all that is his great love for us. And his great love is not because of my, my works, it's because I exist and I'm in relationship with him. That's all he's, that's all he, listen, if that's all he has to work with, is you exist and you be in relationship with him, that is enough for him to be able to keep every promise that he's made to you. Hallelujah. He always answers prayers and he always keeps his word. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 21. This is, this, this, um, what I'm going to go over right now, a couple things. This, this, if you look at it the way I was, it was given to me, it really, um, this is amazing. This is in Second Chronicles chapter 21. We'll start at verse 1 through 7, through 7. Listen to this. It says, And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David. And his son Jehoram reigned in his place. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, and then it goes Azariah again, I think it's a different name, Michael, and Shephatiah. These were all sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and precious things, as well as the fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. When Jehoram had established himself over his father's kingdom. Listen what he did. He strengthened himself by putting to the sword all his brothers along with some of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. Verse 6, it says, And Jehoram walked in the ways of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done. For he married a daughter of Ahab and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So Jehoram was king over Judah, but he married the king of Israel's daughter, and he acted like the king of Israel. That, see, Israel, I think I shared this before, Israel and, and, and Judah had separated. So you have the northern kingdom was Israel, and the southern kingdom was Judah. And the, what Israel did, with, what, was, what they did is, they started their own worship. They started their own worship away from Jerusalem. They, and, and then they had different priests than the Levites and all. So they weren't following what was prescribed by the Father through Moses. So Israel was was a, a, a pro, uh, what's it? I forget the name. But Israel was, basically they were, basically pagans is what they were doing. They established their own worship and that's what became Samaria. And that's why the Jews or Judah and, and the Samaritans had a problem. They had beef because they were like a bastard religion. They, um, they even brought in the Syrians and other people, and then they brought in some, some of the Israelites back to teach them so that the land would be safe for them. But basically, they weren't pure anymore. And they weren't following all the Torah or all the word. So Israel or Judah and Israel had beef. But, so this is kind of what's happening. And so Jehoram, and this is the beginning of it, so I know I jumped way back in the story. But um, Jehoram did evil. He killed his own brothers did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is verse 7. It says, Yet the Lord was unwilling to destroy the house of David because of the covenant he had made with David. And since he had promised to maintain a lamp for David and his descendants forever. Our God loves us so much when he makes a promise. Listen to what, what, Jehoram, what Jehoram did was abhorrent to God. God's into relationships, yet he's killing his brothers. He loves us so much that he's always still trying to figure out a way to help us out. He's trying to show us love. He didn't kill Jehoram. I think about when Cain killed him. God, you know, God still spoke to, to Cain. Cain went and talked to God. And he said, he started talking to God. He said, well, listen, if I go, this is what's going to happen. God's because he loved Cain. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because you exist. Because you exist, he loves you. He loved Cain because he exists, not because of what he did. 
Obviously, he didn't do what was right, so he still loved Cain enough to talk to him. And he said, Cain said, well, people want to kill me. And God says, I'm going to protect you. He protected Cain, who killed his own brother. Now, Jehoram killed brothers, and God, it says in verse 7, he says, the father was unwilling to destroy the house of David. He would have destroyed the house of David had he brought out the proper justice. But because he had made a promise, David's long gone. David's not even here to, to see if the promise is fulfilled. But because Yahweh had made a promise to David, he, why did he make a promise to David? Because he was a man after Yahweh's own heart. And he says, I'm going to make sure your seed will always be righteous, be the ones on the throne. He says, because of the covenant he had made with David, and since he had promised to maintain a lamp for, of David, for David and his descendants forever. <laughs> Listen to this. I want to just read this just because when I read this, this made me chuckle a little bit. In a way, not totally. But um, Jehoram, this is when Jehoram dies. It's down the bottom of this chapter. And um, verse 20. It says, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. And this it says, he died to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. He was so abhorrent that when he died, no one cared. It says, he died to no one's regret. When I read that, it made me chuckle a little bit. It's still sad, but I'm just saying, he, that's how bad he was. Yet because of the father's word and because of his great love, he didn't destroy Jehoram. He did tell him, he said, listen, you, you wanna, because you're walking these ways, this is going to happen. But he had somebody else to, to come in and pick up after him. That was why, because it just, this goes, goes to show you, he loves people. Not because of, you know, so you might think you've done something. Oh, God can, can't forgive me. Listen, he loves you so much that he can forgive you. And he made a way for you not only just to be forgiven, but for you to be made righteous through his son. No matter what you've done in your life, he made a way for you not only just to be forgiven, but for you to be placed in the right position. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Makes me think of that prodigal son. Prodigal son went out and did a lot. We'll probably get to this maybe one of these weeks. But he is not so much focused on what you do as to who you are. Because if you exist, and because you're in relationship. You exist in your relationship. If that's his focus, you get those two things right, you've won. The you've won. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And um, was it Isaiah? I think it's Isaiah 46. Let's turn to Isaiah 46. We're talking about the love of the Father for you. Isaiah 46. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees the end from the beginning. It's one of the scriptures. Anyway, I don't remember where it is right now, but so I won't read that. Obviously, because I don't know where it is. But he sees the end from the beginning. And I think of 46? Oh, verse 10. Okay, thank you. 46, verse 10. Thank you. He says, um, Verse 10, he says, I declare the end from the beginning. So he says things in the beginning that is going to be the end. Why? Because he sits outside of time. You know, and it's hard, I know it's hard to, because we're, we're in this time dimension, so it's hard for us to sometimes understand that. But he's outside of time. He sees the end from the beginning. He's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. That's why he says, I, you know, he says, I, 
I've always existed. He's always existed. So, matter of fact, like I shared before, when we read in the book of Genesis, that's our beginning. That's not his. He was there already. That's why he was talking. So, Genesis, is he's showing us our beginning. And Revelation shows us our ending. Genesis to Revelation. But he is, has no beginning and no ending. And so he sits outside of time. This is not on it, but I'm going to share this. But in a way, this is, he says, he declares the end from the beginning. He wants us to declare the end from the beginning as well. That's why he wants us to call things that be not as though they were. Right now in this beginning, we're calling things that the end. He wants us to be just like him. Why? Because he created us in his image and likeness. He created us, even though we're constrained by time, because this is our dimension, he gives us something, the antidote for it. The, the constraints of time. He gives us his word, which is outside of time. He gives us his word, which produces faith, which puts us into the future to see the end from the beginning. So he declares the end from the beginning, from the beginning, in ancient times from what is still to come. He said, my purpose will stand, and my good pleasure I will accomplish. Hallelujah. So I, why did I say that? I'm talking about the love of the Father. He knows everything you're going to do wrong. But he focuses on the thing you did right. He knows everything because he's, he's outside of time. He knows when you're going to lie, blah, 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 blah. But you think he's focusing on that? No. Here's what he's focusing on. He's Because of his great love for you, he's focusing on the thing you did right, which was accepting his son and the blood of the lamb, which covered everything you've done wrong. He sees the end from the beginning. See, listen, he saw that you needed the blood at the end of your life just like you needed it when you made that decision. He declares the end from the beginning. He declared you to have eternal life when you accepted him. That was your beginning, but he saw your end. He says, you have eternal life right now. He declares your end from your beginning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, you, and your beginning, in a way, if you think about it, really, people who are born again, our beginning was when we declared and accepted Yeshua as our as our Savior. That's when we got born again. That was That's when we should have our birth certificate. So, and, and right then is when he started declaring. I mean, not then, but he declared your, your end from your beginning. He knew you before you were even born. That's in Psalm 138 or 39, where it talks about before you were even born, he wrote a book about you. Why? Why would he write a book about somebody he didn't like? Would you write a book about somebody you don't like? Or are they going to do something wrong? Would you write a book about Caligula? Or Nero? He wrote a book about them too because he loved them. He loved them. He wrote a book about Hitler. Or a chapter about Hitler as well. And other people you might consider, you might consider evil. I'm chuckling because you might consider people evil, but listen, you, if you're considering somebody else evil, that's only because you you might be the best sinner in the bunch. <laughs> that's why you might be considered, oh, they're evil. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> because all of us were before we accepted Christ. And once we accepted him, we became the best of the bunch. <laughs> but while you were while you were a sinner, just because you weren't doing what Genghis Khan and and Ayatollah Khomeini and all these people, just because you weren't doing what they were doing, you were just as bad. You were in the same bushel or same basket. But because of his great love, that was enough for everybody in that bushel. Every, his great love was enough for everybody in that basket. His great love was enough for Hitler to be saved. It was, and, and like I said, listen, if Hitler, just before he died, if he had accepted Christ, you'll meet him in heaven. I know that doesn't sound right, does it? But his great love is not based on what you do as, as far as like your performance. It's based on your relationship with him. His great love. He wants to be in relationship with you. And then he can do the things for you that he is destined for you when you're in relationship with him. If you're not in relationship with him, you can say God all you want. You know, like I said, use them as a sound bite or an anthem or, or a label. You can say God all you want. But it, but there's going to come a time when you're going to say, you say, I did this in your name. I did this in your name. 
I don't care if you said God. I don't care if you said Jesus. But if you did this in his name, he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? Because we weren't in relationship. We needed to be in relationship. You needed to accept the sacrifice of my son. That's all it took, is to accept the sacrifice of my son and make him your Lord. And I'm your father. Because of my great love for you. It's not your performance. It's this relationship. It's great love. Anyway, I was saying, the reason why I was bringing up about the end from the beginning, I think about what he, what he did for Solomon. Now, you think he didn't know Solomon was going to get 700 wives and concubines and, and, and go off the, the, the tracks? He knew that. Why? Because he sees the end from the beginning. But what did he do for Solomon? When Solomon, when he said, Solomon said, listen, I, I, don't, I don't want riches. I want wisdom so I can take care of your people. Solomon was concerned about the relationship at that time. Maybe later he wasn't. Maybe he had too many relationships with evil women and stuff. But he said, listen, at that time, he was concerned about the father's people. He says, I need to, I can't, I can't do this for your children. I can't do this for your people. Give me wisdom. And then the father said, not only will I give you wisdom, because you asked for the right thing, you were worried, more concerned more about relationship. I'm going to give you the things that other people want. I'm going to give you riches and, and all this other stuff. Of course, he wasn't, didn't handle it properly. His, his, why? Because of, he focused on the wrong relationships. If you think about it, that's what he did. Because of the daughter of, uh, of, of Pharaoh and, and some of these other wicked kings, and he started setting up things for them just as high as the temple of, of the Most High God, he started setting up edifices for these people. And he focused more on the wrong, on the wrong relationship, and that's what happened to Solomon. But when he focused on the right relationship, even though the father knew what he was going to do, because he sees the end from the beginning, he still blessed. Him. Think about that for a minute. If you will focus on the relationship, he's not worried about what you're going to do, what you have done. He will bless you just like he did for Solomon. He knew David was going to have Bathsheba, uh, Uriah killed. He knew David was going to commit adultery with Bathsheba. Yet he blessed David. He promised David, I will make sure that your seed will continually be on the, on the throne. Think about that. His love knows no bounds. Maybe we need to let that soak. The Father's love has no bounds when it comes to you. Maybe I should have said that first. When it comes to you, he has no bounds for his love. It's unlimited, his love for you. I tell you, when I think about that, back to that prodigal son who went and, and, and wasted everything the father had father worked for. Not everything, but his portion of it. Wasted it. His father spent his life earning and, and producing this stuff. And his son says, I can't wait for you to die, Dad. Give it to me now. That's basically what he said. It's like somebody, it's like your kid comes in. You know, you didn't die quick enough, so can you give me this stuff now? That's basically, that's really what that was like. When the prodigal son said, give me my inheritance now. Not, listen, he was living there. He was getting to, to experience and enjoy all that was there. That's what he said to, as a matter of fact, he said that to the older son. He said, while you're here, I would have, I would have did a lamb and all this stuff. So it's not like he wasn't able to experience what he wanted to experience, but he wanted to experience it away from them. He wanted to sever the relationship. He says, listen, I need to go off on my own. So give me what I want because you're not dying soon enough. And that's really, if you think about it, that's what the father, that's really what he was hearing. You're not dying quick enough, and I'm tired of you. I'm tired of this place. This place isn't good enough. I'm going to make my own way in the world. Give me what you what you built. <laughs> That's really what he said. And so he gave it to him. And he went off and he wasted it. And then he came back. And his father, while he was a long way off, the same father who had been rejected, when he was a long way off, saw him. And he, he didn't wait for him to show up. He ran toward him which was really unconventional to their culture because he had to lift up his, his garments to run. 
you, a, a Hebrew man was not really supposed to be running like that. So he went against the convention. He went against the culture. And he's showing you that's what the father does. He'll go against the culture for you. The father ran to him and wouldn't allow him to, to make excuses. He said, he said Dad, I, I'm sorry. He says, put on this robe. Put on these shoes. Get the party started. Because my son who is dead is back. So how did he see him a long way off? Was he lucky or was he looking for him? He's looking for him. Why? Because of the relationship. The father's love has no balance for you. He's always looking for you. He's looking for you and looking out for you. Always. So I just think about that. Like, like I said, he knew what Solomon was going to do. But because of the relationship, he blessed him. He knew what David was going to do. But because of the relationship, he blessed him. He's got it. And he's good. And he does good for us. But I'm going to tell you this too. Don't hurt his people. Don't go against his people. Yeshua said it would be better for a millstone to be put around your neck and you cast into the sea if you hurt one of his children. Because he loves his children. He loves those that he's in relationship with. I'm going to say this one last thing and then let's stop here. Think about this. You know, when he would send the disciples out two by two and, and all this stuff he would do for them, do you know he knew somebody was going to betray him? Yet, what did the Messiah do? Did he, treat, did he treat Judas different? Did he treat any of them different, even if he didn't know which one it was? Did he treat any of his disciples different? Or did he bless them and give them the power and authority to go out and cast out demons, to do these things, to feed the 5,000, to feed the 3,000? Did he treat them different? No, he was into relationship. As long as Judah, Judas was, was willing to be in that relationship, he was able to bless them. He didn't treat him any differently than he treated the others. Judas is the one that severed the relationship. If you won't sever the relationship, if you will keep the father as your father, you will let, walk in obedience. I'm telling you, there, there's no limit, there's no boundary for his love for you. He will do everything in his power to help you, to keep you. Does that mean we that everything works perfectly? Do I look perfect? You don't have to answer that. I know I don't. Just because I, I serve him doesn't mean everything's perfect. Why? Because we have an enemy. And that enemy will be dealt with. At one point. But even with an enemy, he still gives us power, he gives us ability, he gives us authority, and he gives us help to meet every circumstance, to meet every need. He gives us power, authority, ability, and resources. He gives us the help. He'll send people, whoever's needed, to help you through. Again, this life, you know, we can't live here forever. And, and, and frankly, the way things are going, I don't think you would want to, to live here forever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. Because I'm ready to go off into something else. <laughs> Where you get me in, it'll be a controversial and, and y'all will be like, and people will be upset. But um, not you, the, the, the alphabet community will be upset. But um, listen, the Father loves you. He really does. And, the, and, the, and the, the better our understanding of his love, the better our understanding of his love, it says your faith works by love. The better you understand the love of the Father, your faith will be more rooted and grounded. You'll know, you'll believe that he'll do the things that you're asking for because you understand that he loves you. You know, in 1 John chapter 5, we'll turn to that real quickly. It says, we'll know that we we'll have the things we're asking. 1 John chapter 5. So, 
in 4 and 5 of, chapter, of John, 1 John, it's talking about the love of God. God is love. It's talking about how uh, we're, we're to be just like him and, and all. And then in verse uh, 13, it says, he's, he's wrapping up this chapter, this letter. And, th and think about this. Now, when, when, they, when John was writing this, he wasn't writing it with verses, and he wasn't writing it with chapters. He just wrote a letter. So this whole letter is, is, is one long stream of, of his thought or his consciousness that he's writing at this time. So that's how this, so he says, so now he's saying, everything I've written from the beginning of this letter to him, in verse 13 he says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of, of Yahweh, so that you may know that you have, re so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not going to get it, right? He says, and look at the verse 14, he says, and this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, period, we need to know that he's looking out for us, he's listening for us. He's just like that father in the prodigal son who was looking for his son. So if we know that he hears us, we know that we already possess what we have asked of him. The more we understand his love for us, the better foundation for our faith. We need to know his love so that our faith will work, because faith works by love, as Galatians 6 verse 5 or 5 verse 6. The faith works by love. So when we know and we understand how much he loves us, that's what John is saying in a way. He says, I've written these things about his love, about his character, about his nature to you who believe in this, in the name of his son. And so you'll know that if you ask anything according to his will. And if he hears you, you need to know that he hears you. Just like a parent. You know, now they got the little monitor things so that we, even when you're in another room, you can hear the baby. He wants you to know that he hears you. Because his monitoring thing is, is not in the other room, it's, it's in your heart. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of the living God is right on the inside of you. So he hears you when you pray. And if you know that he, you've prayed according to his will, and it, you know that he hears you, you know also that you have the things that you've asked of him. Why? Because your faith is based in the knowledge of his love for you. Knowing that he loves you just as much as he loved Billy Graham. Just as much as he loved the Messiah. Just as much, much as he loved Paul the Apostle. He loves you just as much. So when you know that he loves you, and you know that he, you're praying according to his will, and you know that he hears you, then you also know that you have the things that you've asked of your Father who loves you without bounds. you'll know that you already possess it. And that's where, like I said, he's given us his word. You're praying according to his word. His word is outside of time. His word is what gives us the faith to believe that something that's not here yet is already here because it's outside of time. His word is a guarantee because it says he never fails. He's faithful and just to keep his word. And he loves you without balance. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Our God is love. So it says that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He is love. He's composed of love. And that love is directed at each of us. Consistently, continually, without balance. Forever. Do you know how much it hurts him to see people leave this existence without cementing their relationship with him? That hurts him. He hates to see people leave here, but because of not wanting a relationship with him, they leave here and they die and they're forever in a position of being out of relationship with him. That hurts him because he loves those people. We need to love the people that he loves. We need to love people the way he loves them and try to share with these people as well. And he loves them and 
that he wants them. He does not want to be separated from them. He's just like that father, prodigal son. He's looking for them. But who's the people to help them get there? It's us. We show him our love by loving the people that he loves. Amen. 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 Amen.